Welcome back uh, for this afternoon session, Tuesdays. Uh, we have Ian Ako from UC Berkeley. He's going to be talking to us about gaps in social decompositions and the cipher genes. All right, thanks a lot. For, thanks for the invitation to be here. It's great to be in Miami. And um, I guess I changed the title slightly. I forgot to take the title I submitted. But anyways, it'll be the same, same topic. Right, so um, this this talk is about some joint work with Yue Zhang, who's speaking next, and is part of uh, like the first chapter of his uh, thesis from, from a couple years ago. <clears throat> so um, the goal is to study the lack of uniqueness in, in minimal genus cypher surfaces or knots, and but um, more generally we work in the context of Thurston Norman three manifolds, but I, I thought I'd start out talk about the knot case and then, and then move to greater generality. <clears throat> So um, a basic fact known from knot theory is um, if you get a knot K that's fibered, then there's a unique minimal genus ciphered surface that bounds the knot. So there's, there's a um, unique sigma, boundary, boundary sigma is equal to, to K up to, up to isotopy. And um, but generally, if you have a compact orientable manifold with irre irreducible with uh, torus boundary components and then you have a, an element of the first cohomology group um, which is induced by a vibration so by that I mean we have a, a map phi from the three manifold to the circle um, so vibration if that map is everywhere non-singular so you get a Submersion from the three manifold to the circle. And then the pre image of any point then will be a, a surface, possibly with boundary. If there's, that's why we need torus boundary components so that um, it's possible to fiber. And then you have the fundamental class of, um, of the circle pulls back to, um, so here I, I wrote M, I think I meant um, S1 here. So, um, Take the fundamental cl class of the circle, you pull it back to the three manifold, and that gives you a, a cohomology class of the three manifold. So we say that the cohomology class is fibered if it's if it's a pullback of such a cohomology class from a vibration. And again, if if it's fibered, then there's a unique surface representing the point gray dual um, two-dimensional homology class rel boundary that's um, that's that's one of these pre-images um, of a <clears throat> of any point in the circle. All those pre-images will be isotopic and induced by vibration. Of course, you can get this from taking a surface, taking the homeomorphism of the surface, and then taking the mapping torus of that to get the corresponding vibration. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> so let me briefly define the, the Thurston norm. And give an example. So um, if we have a surface chi minus of f, and um, I think some of this was discussed yesterday, but we had um, some other people here, so I'll just review this. So, so you sum over components of the surface of the maximum of the negative all characteristic in zero. So in other words, you, you have some surface, all the disks and sphere, orientable surface, I should say, um, uh, but all the, all the disks and spheres, um, yeah, I should have said here, F, um, say orientable. So all the disks and spheres count as zero, and then you take the um, negative all the characteristic what's left. <clears throat> and then for a given um, homology class in H2 rel boundary, of course, a point gray duality, that will be dual to some one dimensional cohomology class, if you like. But um, so um, so here I wrote C hat where we have a say a general cohomology class Z, then we can take its point gray dual will be some will represent a surface rel boundary. The fundamental class of that surface maps to the to that two dimensional homology class. Then you can define the Thurston norm is the minimum of chi minus of f over all surfaces representing that homology class. So Thurston showed that for um, for for a manifold such as such as above, but um, it's actually a little more general. But 
we'll just restrict in that context that um, this is a semi-norm. So if I add two homology classes, then um, x of the, of the sum will be less than or equal to the, the sum of the, of the norms of these two classes. And um, it's also multiplicative. Um, again, I think this was mentioned yesterday, but um, x extends to a semi-norm on H2 of M rel boundary. Um, <clears throat> and it has this um, sort of multiplicativity property. So, um, and Thurston showed that there's, that the unit, all this, oh, and I should say also that um, if the manifold's toroidal, then this, um, so if you have a homology class represented by a torus or by an annulus, the only characteristic will be of that, uh, the Thurston world will be zero, and then you get a degenerate norm. That's why it's only a, a semi norm in general. But um, if the manifold's hyperbolic or um, maybe some other hypotheses, then this semi norm is, can actually be a norm. It's just if you have no homologically um, non separating tori or annuli, basically. So, um, for example, if we take M to be the, the complement of the whitehead link, so, um, so if I take the whitehead link, thinking about this it's sitting inside of the three sphere, so we sort of end up compactified. Um, then um, the um, so the whitehead link is you know just a two component link in S three. You take a boundary of a regular you take a regular neighborhood and you remove the interior, and then the complement is the what I'm meaning by the whitehead link complement. So it's a compact manifold with two torus boundary components. Then the the Thurston norm in this case um, has a finite sided polyhedral unit ball. So if I take either component, the linking number is zero, so I can find a surface representing that, that bounds that component that's disjoint from the other component. So you can um, find like a yellow three-punctured sphere, and then you, you tube it together to get a, a punctured torus. And um, chi minus of that surface is one. Um, there's a similar one that the two components are symmetric with each other. So there's a similar one that in the green one that I didn't draw. So you also get um, the point gray dual of the um, so the green component will be will also have chi minus equal to one, and um, you get this finite sided <clears throat> polyhedron for the Thurston norm unit ball. So um, So Thurston proved that if you have a fiber class, then in the interior of, so it, well, first of all, the um, fiber class lies in the interior of a face of the Thurston norm unit ball. And moreover, every other integral class in that cone over that face. So here I've, I've drawn a, um, an example in, in the whitehead link. So here's a, here's a, a face of the unit ball. And then we take the interior of the cone over that face. So that's that's this um, quadrant. <clears throat> and you take any integral point in there, and that um, his theorem says that if there's one fiber class in there, then all the other ones in that face will be will correspond to a fiber class. So that's <clears throat> Thurston's um, sort of fiber face theorem. So um, <clears throat> in our example for the for the whitehead link. So I, I drew these two, or one surface, but there's another one that um, they, they bound one component at a time. But if you look at a Seifert surface for the whitehead link, so you can apply, say, Seifert's algorithm. Um, you, know, you take your Seifert circles, and then you, you connect them with little, um, little bands. And it turns out that this is a fibered surface bounding the whitehead link. And in fact, it's realized as a, um, in homology, it'll be realized as this um, some of these um, these two these two generators. So it lies in the interior of this hybrid face. The um, the only characteristic adds. So this has only characteristic minus two, and so um, so that's why the unit ball is it, you know, the, the unit point is half half of that. Um, the, the first norm is two, and then the, you take half of that to get the the point on the unit ball. <clears throat> okay, so that's a uh, um, an example of the, of the Thurston norm and his, and his five ring theorem. And so when you look at these um, vertices, then 
They, they, they cannot be fiber classes. And you, you can sort of see that here. Well, if I had a fibration of this complement, it certainly has, has to meet both components, but this fiber only meets one component. So it's sort of obvious in that case that it can't be fibered sort of to see the converse in that context. But he proved more generally that um, points sitting over lower dimensional faces of that Thurston norm ball are not fibered. So part of the goal of this talk is to describe the sort of generalization of, um, of Thurston's theorem to the other faces of the, of the Thurston norm ball. Is there any questions so far or comments? Okay, so um, so um, so I said that uh, fibered knot. The there's a unique minimal genus cypher surface, which is the fiber. But Thurston proved that something more general, which is his motivation, I think, for introducing the notion of the Thurston norm, is that. Um, if you have a taut oriented foliation of, um, this is a, I should say, co dimension one. So a, a surface foliation of a three manifold. Um, and if you have a compact leaf of that foliation, then that leaf is norm minimizing in its homology class. So um, I believe that was sort of the, the motivation for introducing this norm. So in other words, chi minus of f is equal to the x of the homology class of f. So top foliation, well, it's a foliation by, um, so it's a decomposition of the manifold into surfaces. Locally, it'll just look like you have these charts that, that cover it with what look like a disk crossed an interval. And then they patch together in a way that, that patches the, the two-dimensional leaves together. And it's all these leaves are globally oriented. So it's an oriented foliation on an oriented three manifold. But the, the tot notion means that there's a, and since we're in a compact manifold, um, there's a there's a closed loop in the manifold that's transverse everywhere to the leaves and meets every single leaf. That's one one way to express the notion of tautness. And so um, there are examples of foliations on three manifolds that are not taught, and hence this is a, a non-trivial notion. <clears throat> so again, if you have a, a vibration of the circle, then um, then the leaves form a taut foliation. It's not hard um, to take a take a loop that's transverse to the um, to the leaves of, the, of your vibration that goes all the way around and it meets the fiber. And, um, and then you can sort of make it make it close up um, using if um, on a connected component of the fiber, for example. So um, so this generalizes the notion of a of a manifold fibering over the circle. <clears throat> but the leaf space of a taut foliation in general can be very nasty and complicated. So um, the notion there's not a, quite a natural notion of a fibering vibration of a of a taut foliation. <clears throat> But a, um, anyways, a, a classic theorem of, of goodbye is that for any knot, um, it's much more general than this, but again, I'll state it for knots in the three sphere. If you have a minimal genus cyphered surface for a knot, then there exists a taut foliation F of the knot complement, which, um, so F is the leaf of that foliation. And when you restrict F to the boundary, it's a foliation by longitudes. And, and again, when I talk about a knot complement, I've removed a tubular neighborhood of the knot. So it's a compact manifold with torus boundary. <clears throat> and so you get this um, taut foliation of the, um, of the knot complement. The fact that it's bounded by longitudes means that um, <clears throat> you can cap off you can do a zero frame Dane surgery on the knot and cap off those leaves by discs to get a top foliation on the zero frame surgery. And this has an interesting consequence that he, was, uh, that he proved this property R that you can't, for a non trivial knot, zero frame surgery on it cannot give you S2 plus S1. More strongly, it can't give you, uh, it has a top foliation and it's um, irreducible. Any, um, <clears throat> any manifold. Um, 
with the top foliation also is irreducible. S2 cross S1 has a, um, um, oh, sorry, I guess or it's either S2 cross S1 by the rate of stability theorem or it's, um, or it's irreducible. So, um, so S2 cross S1 with its foliation by, vibration by, by two spheres is the only um, reducible mantle. S2 cross S1 is prime, but it has an essential sphere, so it's, um, that's the only reducible example. Anyways, um, so in particular, the the ciphered surface for a knot is Thurston norm minimizing. In fact, it's Thurston norm minimizing in the zero frame surgery. So the genus of a knot will be the same as the genus of when you when you cap it off by a zero frame surgery. But Fenley proved something slightly stronger um, that there is no essential annulus in a knot complement, um, which goes from the ciphered surface. So here, M is, a, is the complement of K, F is some ciphered surface. There's no essential annulus that, that goes from the ciphered surface to the boundary. Um, it would have to be the longitude, because the, the boundary slope of the ciphered surface is the longitude. But um, any such annulus would have to be sort of uh, boundary parallel which is kind of an interesting, um, so it, the, the reason I'm stating this is that if you had such an annulus, then you could find other um, surfaces that, that realize the Thurston norm that weren't ciphered surfaces. So this is saying that any surface that is um, Thurston norm minimizing, it doesn't have any like two sphere components or whatever, so it's connected, actually is a ciphered surface. That's it's, you, you can't have one of these things that has maybe multiple boundary components of maybe opposite orientation, but that sort of thing can't happen. What's the hypothesis of Fenley's theorem? It's a knot complement. Okay. And F is the yeah, I'm still talking theory. about knot complements in the and, three sphere. And F is the symmetry surface sphere. coming out of the device theorem. Well, any minimal genus cipher surface. Oh, any minimal genus. Yeah. That's what his theorem is. Well, do you need many more genus? Oh, maybe I need, uh, maybe I, sorry, I, sh I should have said hyperbolic here. Um, sorry about that. Thanks. Um, Okay, have a ball. Thanks. So, in so he proves that the cybered surface in a hyperbolic knot couple in the middle of the cybered surface is quasi fuchsia. In Kabai's term, is it, there exists an F or for all F? Um, yeah, for any, for all F, yeah. Um, but, uh, but if F is minimal genus, when you close it up under surgery, if you can find such an annulus, then that actual surface would compress, no? And, and that right. So, um, yeah, I guess that's maybe just a, a proof right there. Yeah. yeah. That, that, um, right. So, therefore, you don't. Yeah, I think. Oh, oh maybe I don't need hyperbolic then. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, you don't need hyperbolic. Yeah, I guess. You just you need non triviality. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> right, yeah, that's. Um, <clears throat> Anyways, um, the Gabay's theorem is proved by induction on a suture manifold hierarchy. So he, he constructs his foliation starting with the cyphered surface and adding in leaves one at a time and actually constructs a fine depth taut foliation on the knot complement um, with these properties. So um, let me say a, a bit about suture manifolds. Um, so suture manifolds, an oriented manifold. Um, Usually it will be with boundary today, but you can also have closed ones. Um, that's um, anyways. The boundary of the manifold is decomposed into subsurfaces. There's a surface R plus, a surface R minus, and an A where um, there's the um, a union of annuli. I think I, I dropped off the, the T here. So A of gamma and the T of gamma. So. Um, T of gamma is a union of tori, and the the boundary of so R plus and R, this this is a the interiors of these surfaces are just joints, and their boundaries uh, boundary of R plus and boundary of R minus will be the boundary components of A. <clears throat> and so we'll write um, a suture manifold will be denoted by n comma gamma. So um, gamma we use a lot of times we think of a gamma or by in his notation, he 
usually thinks of gamma as like some closed curves that are cores of these annuli, and then together with the tori. <clears throat> so the, uh, the basic example is a surface crossed with an interval where r plus and minus are the f cross plus and minus one, and then the, the annulus is the boundary of f crossed with an interval. And this is called a product suture manifold. Um, and, and then um, R plus and R minus are oriented as well. Um, so if we choose some orientation of M, then um, R plus will be oriented um, with the, um, the induced normal pointing outwards, and R minus with the induced normal pointing inwards. So um, we, could, um, we could indicate that with some orientations here and then. R minus will be um, well in this picture. R minus is sort of on the on the inside here, um, and that will be um, oriented pointing in. And then the annuli will be these um, the boundary components of that. Okay, so that's the basic. Um, so <clears throat> if we started with a fiber knot and we, um, we we can cut along a ciphered surface, then the complement is a is a product suture manifold. And um, goodbye, well, then you can immediately extend this to a top foliation of a product suture manifold. You just take the product foliation. And then that extends to a foliation of the knot complement. But what goodbye showed by this inductive construction that I'm not going to go into today, but uh, just to motivate the, the why, um, where the notion of suture manifold comes from, um, <clears throat> he showed that um, a suture manifold satisfying some properties, namely tautness, will admit a, a finite depth top foliation. And so um, he used this in an inductive argument um, to construct foliations on, um, on certain manifolds, particularly not complements. Another example is um, a solid torus with four longitudinal sutures. And again, some of these things we encountered yesterday in, in Luis's talk and other times. Um, so um, you, have a, you have a solid torus and then the annuli here maybe are um, are four four sutures. There's two in front and then sort of two mirrors in the back. And notice the um, we orient them in in, in a way that um, <clears throat> the orientations on um, an R plus are consistent, and an R minus will be um, sort of um, going in, into the manifold. So this would be. This would be R plus in my notation, and R minus, and then they they alternate. And then A here is actually a tubular neighborhood of the green sutures. So I just have I've drawn them as as um, curves instead of as annual, just to make the picture a little simpler. So that's a that's an example of a um, <clears throat> suture manifold that's not a product suture manifold. There is a product structure here. Um, you know, it looks sort of like a disc with four points in the boundary crossed with a circle. <clears throat> but it's not product in the sense of, uh, of this, this notion of product suture manifold. Um, you can modify a uh, um, product suture manifold to get um, what's called a book of eye bundles. So I take, a, again, a surface crossed an interval. And I take a curve on the surface, and I take it sort of halfway between a level zero. And then I do a Dane filling on that curve. Then um, what you get is <clears throat> um, called a book of eye bundles. So um, I, you might have this, the surface might have multiple components uh, as well. There's there's more general ways you can get these things, but um, this is an example of a of a, of a book of eye bundles. <clears throat> and now it's and again this is it was encountered in um, in some of the talks yesterday. Um, <clears throat> So, um, does it matter which surgery you do? Is it surface sloped? Or? Um, maybe I don't want to do meridional surgery. Uh, or let's see. I don't want to do longitudinal surgery. So let's say R is not equal to zero. Thanks. <clears throat> um, given the framing from that picture induced inside of S3, for example, the R is, yeah. So I don't, if I did longitudinal surgery, that would compress the surfaces and it wouldn't, wouldn't be, um, Book of bundles, but it's coming from the, um, the the surface. If I take the surface cross with zero, then it sort of comes in and it it sort of winds around the core of this thin filling. 
and so you get this so the the core of the vein filling is the spine of the book and then the the, the surfaces are the pages that come into that spine that's where the the name book of eye bundles comes from <clears throat> Another example that will come up, I think, in Yue's talk next is, um, is this suture manifold. So again, topologically, the manifold is just a handle body. But um, I have an annulus suture going around here. And, um, and then again, the R plus and R minus are oriented. I haven't drawn the orientations, but like that. And then there's some other annuli. So I drilled out um, some sort of knotted holes here that um, those are also um, annuli in the suture. So there's three sutures, these three annuli. And um, <clears throat> this, anyway, so, so this will come up in, in, in UA's talk. And then uh, from Gabay's theory, this is actually a paper, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a picture from Gabay's paper. Um, so Thurston's paper on the Thurston norm appeared in this um, me memoir, the AMS, and then the um, Paper before that, though, was Gabay's paper where he, he proved the existence of these top foliations on many knots, the arc, what are called the arborescent knots. That, um, <clears throat> so the, the, the example, you know, the key example then of a suture manifold in his context was you take a, you take a knot or a link and you take a minimal genus or minimal Thurston norm cypher surface for it. And, um, and then the complement of that, so if I sort of split the, the link complement along the surface, and the complement is is a suture manifold, so that's sort of one of the key other key examples of um, the suture manifolds. <clears throat> um, so, uh, any any questions or comments so far? All right. Um, now, under what context can if I create this top foliation, well, um, <clears throat> we, um, we say that N is, is taught if, whoops, if um, R plus or minus are norm minimizing in um, H2 of N rel A. Um, and you need um, R plus or minus to be incompressible and N is irreducible. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so this, these, the, the theory is a little technical, and I just warn you that you look at Gabay's papers in JDG, and there's there's some issues there, some missing hypotheses and thing, and, I, and I'm probably carrying on that tradition today. But um, anyways, the, um, the just a warning that um, you know the there are, the theory can be a little bit technical because of all these different hypotheses. So an ex a non-example, just for um, comparison, is. If I take well, if I take a sphere with one suture, then that's a product suture manifold. So it looks sort of like um, uh, a disc crossing an interval. If I take that green suture, I thicken it up to an annulus, then it's just a disc crossing interval. But if I stick another suture on there, then um, then this is no longer taut, and this is key because you can't find a foliation of this suture manifold and um, where it fails. So these, these surfaces are Thurston norm minimizing because I have two disks. R plus would be um, you know, like two disks here. And um, R minus would be an annulus. The Thurston norms are all zero, so they're norm minimizing. But, um, but this, this middle uh, annulus here is compressible, so it doesn't satisfy this hypothesis of a, of a tautness. So that's sort of a, one of the technical things that, that goes into defining these, these things. And in general, um, we say that a surface is taut if it's both norm minimizing and there's, there's no collection of components of it that um, are homologically trivial. Um, if it's norm minimizing, those components would have to have um, all the characteristic zero or, or, uh, or non-negative, I guess. But um, Usually, again, we're dealing with irreducible manifolds, so we just have to be Tori and annuli. But um, again, that, that's sort of a um, that. So that's that's basically the definition of a taut suture manifold. So we want R plus and minus to be norm minimizing in their homology class, and of course, this is a necessary condition to admit a taut foliation because the first theorem is saying that a closed leaf of a taut foliation is norm minimizing in its homology class. So that's um, and so goodbye is kind of proving a, a converse to that. Now we say that a, a suture manifold, here, here maybe I should have said, um, so 
sorry, and comma gamma. So I'm, I'm dealing with suture manifolds here. It's, <clears throat> it's horizontally prime if there's no um, surface contained in it whose whose boundary, so there's no surface F whose boundary is in in A, which is representing the same homology class as R plus or minus rel um, <coughs> sutures. Um, sorry, I think I also I, I should have said A union T here. Um, let me just write that. Um, so um, <clears throat> R plus and minus their their boundary components oriented boundary components are are, um, are homologous to each other. Um, so there's no so I sort of schematically there's R plus is on top and R minus is on bottom and we can't find any F that sort of splits the two, which is both norm minimizing in the sense I've described and then um, um, or actually I should say Todd again or um, so there's no um, no collection of closed components that's homology trivial as well and which is not parallel to R plus or minus so um, if we had such a surface we could cut along it and we would get two new suture manifolds the, the one on top and the one above because it's homologous to R plus and minus it would have to separate the manifold and you would get two um, two new non-product suture manifolds again if it was parallel then those one of those would be a product but um, but that's we're hypothesizing that away. So um, anyway, so um, so we say it's it's horizontally prime if, if this holds. And so if you have such a surface like that, then you can you can find simpler suture manifolds, and you could try to construct <clears throat> top relations on those, and then and then just sort of glue them together along this. So this this would end up you being able to create a top relation with that as a leaf as well if you had such a thing. And so you can sort of simplify things. And Gabay defines a complexity that decreases under these this kind of cut using normal surface theory, but um, I'm not going to again talk about that today. But <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now that's that's one kind of decomposition you can do for a suture manifold. And I'm not again I'm not going to talk about the more general decomposition today, that, um, <clears throat> which I think will come up in UA's talk. But um, I guess. Um, Another sort of decomposition, though, is you can have a, a product region of a, of a suture manifold, um, a Todd suture manifold, for um, is a is a surface cross interval in there where um, so it's a it's it's a sub suture manifold. So the f f cross one my, uh, minus one is in R minus f cross one is in R plus. And the boundary is contained in the um, the sutures, the annular sutures of um, of n. So it's it's a sort of sub suture manifold, so that um, the the two f cross plus or minus ones are essential in R plus or minus, and also it's not just parallel into some neighbor. It's not just sort of some trivial uh, annulus cross interval that's parallel into some neighborhood of of the annuli. <clears throat> And by JSJ theory, um, for applied to this Todd suture manifold, there's a unique maximal product region that contains any other product region up to isotopy. So I'll call that W. This is what Thurston calls the window in a slightly more general context. But <clears throat> so that, that's the the window of the suture manifold, and then we we call the guts of n gamma, um, or Gabay also calls this the reduced suture manifold. Is we call it gamma of n gamma gamma is n minus the neighborhood of the window. <clears throat> so let's look at an example. Well, we have a product suture manifold, then the window is everything, and then um, the guts is empty. And here I should say that the notion that the term guts, I've sort of overused it maybe in my uh, some of my papers, but um, it, it originated a paper of Gabay and Gusez where they defined guts of a lamination. And if you think of the R plus and minus as a lamination, um, <clears throat> then this is this is really their um, more or less the, the guts that they consider uh, with a slight um, slight caveat there but um, which is why we're using that term but just just be warned it's not exactly the same as the term guts that they're using <clears throat> so we have the the empty guts um, also there's the book of eye bundles that we have here and um, what's the what's the maximal product region the window in the, in this example. 
Again, this came up in talks yesterday. <clears throat> Here, I'm assuming maybe R is um, not an integral or something. I think I did. So it's not just you're not just doing a Dane twist and getting the product manifold again. Getting a solid torus. Or it's not one over n, I should say. Getting a solid torus with uh, yeah two curves, I guess. Two sutures of right. Like yeah. 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 So. Um, so the window here would be um, uh, a pair of pants crossed with an interval um, that surrounds this um, <clears throat> this solid torus, and um, and so the, the guts would be um, some <clears throat> some solid torus with some sutures that, that correspond to um, the sutures will correspond to these annuli that we, that we cut along, and they will um, they will wind around some number of times. So we get some sutures that you know there'll be two copies of these. Maybe I won't try to draw the other one, but there's some uh, some other suture there. <clears throat> so that's the sort of thing. And then and so that's so the guts is capturing the non-product part of the of the suture manifold. This is. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and and then in this case, um, well, it turns out there there's uh, the guts is, is empty in that case. But again, we, we you could always take some neighborhood of the boundary um, that's going to be product. But but I but one of my assumptions was that um, this product region is not just in a regular neighborhood of the boundary. So um, so this this has um, the guts is. The guts of this suture manifold is just equal to itself. <clears throat> Any comments or questions? All right, so, um, so now let's take a um, n gamma taught suture manifold and take um, a second homology class and then <clears throat> rel a of gamma then and here um, generally we're going to be doing this when n is either like a manifold with torus boundary components and all, all the tori or the sutures or um, or when um, when n is a suture manifold usually z will be the, the homology class of, of r plus or minus <clears throat> Then a, a facet surface F is a union of um, a collection of disjoint norm minimizing, maybe I should really say taut, um, taut surfaces that um, <clears throat> sigma 1 through sigma k, um, F is a union of these. Each of these sigma i's is representing the same z in H2. <clears throat> and, um, and maybe I should assume it's uh, like a primitive class, but. Um, and then um, you know, the boundaries of these sigma i's lie in the lie in the, the annuli um, or in the in the sutures. And it, here, oh sorry, I guess I, I keep I think I messed up some of my notation here, but this should be really U T of gamma as well. Sorry. They could they could lie in the annu and, and just in the sutures. <clears throat> and then no no two of the sigma i and sigma j are parallel. Um, <clears throat> so. These, each of these surfaces is homologous to each other. They're all disjoint and norm minimizing. Um, and <clears throat> you know, now we're getting close to the, the Kakamitsu complexes, which is where the term uh, facet, facet is coming from. Then um, if we take n and we, we cut along a regular neighborhood of f to get a complement n sub f, this is a taut suture manifold, which is horizontally prime. So if we if we had um, another surface we could fit in there that was homologous to R plus or minus in that region, then it would be homologous to one of these sigma i's. And then our, um, but if it wasn't parallel, then we would we would be able to throw in another surface, and we did not get have a maximal collection, so we didn't have a facet. <clears throat> so basically, what we're doing is taking a suture manifold. If this if the z is the um, homology class of R plus or minus, then we're just taking as many cuts along um, prime, you know, to, to get it's sort of like a prime decomposition for a suture manifold. 
I should say here that a lot of um, another motivation for thinking about these things is that um, Yuhas has this notion of sutured floor homology, and under these horizontal decompositions of a, of a sutured manifold, um, the, the floor homology is, is, is isomorphism. So these, um, <clears throat> these horizontal cuts like this don't change the rank of, of sutured floor homology of a, suture, of a taut sutured manifold. Um, his thought, just warning, his, you know, you have his thought that you may have to satisfy some extra hypotheses that I'm not assuming. Yeah. Is being a maximum collection part of the definition of facet surface, or is that part of the? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I put maximal here. Is that? I didn't check. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, that's, that's key here. So we're, we're just cutting, doing as many horizontal decompositions as we can. <clears throat> then, um, then this suture manifold is reduced in the sense of goodbye. Um, and um, oh, just another remark. Yeah, I'm also requiring that I've been a little careless about some hypotheses here, like I indicated, but the, I want all the bounding components of that to be homologically parallel on each component of of, um, of A, so um, so I don't I don't want um, um, if, if you had two components which were um, which are homologically anti-parallel, then you can sort of you, you can two them together by an annulus and get a surface with the same other characteristic, but which has fewer bounding components. So you can always arrange for surfaces of the sort. I mean, we're already assuming that these were. Uh... Oh yeah, maybe that's part of my uh, yeah. Anyways, I just uh, I just was remarking that yeah, the, these surfaces will have that property that they're um, that they're uh, they, they don't have these. Um, so let's look at an example again. So we have the whited link drawn in a slightly different way, and here's a, a one-dimensional um, homology class. We take its dual. Um, Two-dimensional homology class, and it's realized by. Uh, um, and again, we saw this example uh, in talks yesterday. It's realized by uh, a punctured torus. Actually, it's realized by two punctured torus. There's a. Uh, there's one. There's one down here as well. <clears throat> or is it actually different? Well. I mean, I, I just, they're actually isotopic in the three sphere, yeah. So remember, there's a in R three they wouldn't be isotopic, but in 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 S three um, this the, this actually you can see like a parallel annulus here, and you can see one over here, and that's sort of enough to give you um, that it's actually a product. So these are actually the same surface of the isotopy, <clears throat> and it, tur it turns out that that's a facet surface. So again, because of this condition here, we could have chosen um, you know like um, this um, disk here. This is a norm minimizing surface in its homology class, but it has these two these two boundary components that are anti-parallel, um, you know, sort of around this um, component here. So we're not we're not throwing that in as part of our facet surface, just to um, to be clear. So yeah, it's not tight. Yeah, it's not taught. Yeah, it's norm minimizing, but not taught. It's one of these again, one of these technical conditions. <clears throat> so then um, we can cut n n is the whitehead link complement along a neighborhood of our um, of our surface here f because these are two these are parallel. We can sort of draw the the blue one and the red one here, and it, it's the same thing. And this is our um, suture manifold. It's got Really, it's a um, it's this genus two handle body here with a suture running around it, and then it's got this yellow torus in the interior. So it's got these two boundary components, and the, the yellow torus is part of the suture. <clears throat> now there's a product region here. Um, so we've we've I've already drawn in the annuli. Um, so there's a pair of pants here. So when we that's the window. This is the, the, the window for the suture manifold. And then we, we cut out that window, and we're left with the, um, the guts of that, of that homology class, of that um, suture manifold. So this is the, 
this is the, the gamma for that. There's no, um, you know, R plus is up here and R, R minus is down here. Are these um, annual life? <clears throat> Another example is a plumbing or a Morris sum. So <clears throat> if I take two links, L1 and um, L2, with um, their with minimal genus cyphered surfaces bounding them, Thurston are minimizing or taught um, <clears throat> cyphered surfaces if it's a link. Then um, there's a concept of plumbing, which is drawn here, or Murasugi plumbing, where you might have more um, higher degree polygons. So you, you look at, for plumbing, you have a, a rectangle in the surface that has alternating sides lie on the link and on the interior and the link in the, in the interior. And if I take these two links, and I take these two disks, and I, the rest of the link, hopefully it's clear in this drawing, you know, L2 lies, the rest of it lies down here, and L1, they're not sneaking around or something, so they, they align these two half spaces. <clears throat> then I can glue the two surfaces along these disks in, a, in an alternating way so that the, the, um, the link part of one gets glued to the interior part of the next one. And then you, and the, the sort of interior parts vanish then we can sort of uh, take this part of the link and then um, and continue along there. If you did this with a bygone, so if I plumb along a bygone, that's just a connect sum. <clears throat> of course, a connect sum for, for knots, that's well defined if they're oriented. For links, the connect sum is not quite well defined, so you have to make some choice of bygone. <clears throat> so this is generalizing uh, connect sum too. Now, there's a little cool fact here, though, that um, you know, when I um, <clears throat> I have these disks here, and I could smash them together like this to get a, a new link and together with a cypher surface. But there's another sort of, um, maybe not quite as obvious, but uh, natural surface. I could first take my disk here, and I can flip it outwards to get a disk T prime. I guess I haven't drawn the intermediate thing, but I could flip each of these disks outward. And again, this is a three sphere, so this is really a, a disk and not a not an annulus. And then I I can smash them together on the outside. <clears throat> and um, if you think about it for, um, for a minute, you can see that these two surfaces you create, well, you get the same link, but the two surfaces can be made disjoint from each other. And so you get two um, sort of natural uh, surfaces for this resulting link. <clears throat> um, so, so we get a new link L from L1 and L2 by this plumbing operation, which you know, depends on all these choices we made. But we get two surfaces, S and S prime, both of which lie, you know, they're, um, well, so from, um, from Gavai's theorem, it turns out that if you started with the taut surfaces, that the, the resulting plumbings, both these plumbings will also be taut. Um, and, um, S and S prime will be disjoint Yeah, so let me, let's see, I think, I, oh, I guess, I thought I had the picture for that. Um, yeah, you can sort of, uh, sorry, I, I guess I, maybe I have it in photos somewhere. Maybe I'm not going to try to pull that up. I guess. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, um, you sort of um, push this one in a little bit, and push this one out, and then you can make the, those two pieces disjoint, and then you, this one um, gets, and then it's, um, it's sort of the opposite over here. And, um, and then you can make, you can you can sort of hook them up with the, the two purple discs. The, the, the purple discs are disjoint. You, you can sort of they'll spiral around the little uh, corners here. But you, it turns out you can make them disjoint. Sorry, I thought I, I thought I had the picture, but I guess I uh, I didn't put it in here. I could look for it in my in my photos, I guess. But maybe maybe I won't try to do that. Um. <clears throat> so. It turns out then that the guts, the S union S prime, I, I guess I've neglected to draw the sutures here, but um, there's some natural sutures coming from when you have a, a link complement in a cyphered surface, the sutures are coming from the tubular neighborhood of the knots, which is a torus, cut along the boundary of the cyphered surface. So that's the, there's, there's some sutures here that I've dropped, but anyways, it turns out that the guts of this 
plumb surface will be um, <clears throat> the union of the guts of F1 and F2. So, um, so you can you can sort of identify you you, you sort of take the guts for um, for F2 and you extend them along with some pockets that lie in, um, in between these two surfaces, which is a product suture manifold. When you remove the window, that product, then you get back to the guts of that of L2 that you've started with, and similar um, in the opposite way for, for L1. Maybe I should try to uh, find that. That's, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's a little dangerous to try to look at. <laughs> there you go. There. Ah, there it is. <clears throat> so that's kind of the picture of the. So you have these kind of product. Re oh, now I can't point to it, but um, you have these. The guts for the surface down here, and then it, it sort of gets there's a product region that gets added on under the plumbing. And when you remove that by removing the windows, then you get back to the guts of L2. And similar for um, you can sort of see the, the product region sort of going down like a pita pocket down there or something on that side that um, it also gets cut out when you remove the product region and you get the guts of, of L1 on top. <clears throat> So, um, moreover, if you have facet surfaces for the LIs, you can plumb those facet surfaces together to get facet surfaces for um, for L. Um, and the corresponding homology class, natural homology class coming from the orientation of the wing. <clears throat> so this is just an example. I'm trying to give you some sort of example of how you can have sort of non-trivial facet surfaces. <clears throat> from these sort of plumbings. All right, so the theorem that, uh, in our paper, the main theorem is that if you have a um, have an irreducible manifold towards boundary, orientable, non-degenerate, I probably forgot some hypotheses, but anyways, non-degenerate, Thurston norm is important. Then, um, and you have some homology class in there, and you have a facet surface representing that class, then the the guts of that facet surface, so you, you cut the manifold along that surface, so you've made a sort of maximal collection of choices of different cipher surfaces if it's not complement, and then you take the guts of those, you sort of cut out all the product regions. What's left didn't depend on the choice of facet surface up to isotopy in the manifold. And so we call this suture manifold the guts of, the, of Z. Um, so it's the it's a guts of that homology class. <clears throat> um, so special, specializing to a knot, then um, <clears throat> there's a suture manifold sitting inside of any knot or um, maybe oriented link complement as well that's that's unique up to isotopy. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's sort of like a and so that what this is <clears throat> telling you is that when you um, get by as this Again, I, you know, the motivation for this was Gabay was constructing suture uh, manifold hierarchies to create top foliations, and there's a lot of different choices of how you cut at each stage. But this is saying that if you make sort of the most obvious choices, these these horizontal decompositions, if they exist, and then the vertical decompositions coming from product suture manifolds, no matter which choice you make, you'll get the same um, suture manifold after those um, horizontal and vertical decompositions. So that's um, where this is coming from. And part of the motivation for this was, uh, well, I'll get maybe later. It was, but it, it, this sort of originated um, when I was thinking about the, the virtual fibering conjecture and gave a criterion for um, for manifolds to be to be virtually fibered. So this is sort of the origin of these of some of these ideas. But um, and so I. I suspected this was true a while ago, but I, um, anyway, so now we, we have uh, the proof of this. <clears throat> As specializing to a knot, then there, yeah, so you have this um, unique um, suture manifold sitting inside of a knot complement that's sort of obstructing the fibredness of that knot. <clears throat> so now if we take MSK to denote the Kakamitsu complex, um, I'll just redefine it. It was defined yesterday, but um, here I'm taking the minimal genus surface Kakamitsu complex, not just in compressible surfaces. So vertices are isotopic classes of minimal genus cypher surfaces, and then the edge between vertices um, 
if they have disjoint representatives, if you can isotope two cyber surfaces to be disjoint. And so a term of um, Thompson, or is it Sean Thompson? Anyways, that you can, um, that this cat can be two complexes connected. So if you have any two cyber surfaces in a normal <coughs> genus, even if they intersect, you can find a sequence of disjoint cyber surfaces that go from one to the other. <clears throat> The maximal simplices of, then of this Kakamitsu complex correspond to facet surfaces for the not complement, and hence that's where we came up with that term. And then the dimension then is the well, it turns out that the, it's the number of components of our gut region minus one. So the number of vertices is um, so in, in each. Let me just. Um, so if this was sort of um, schematic, so we have a, a bunch of facet surfaces, and maybe this is connecting up top to bottom. So this is some knot complement that's then cut open along a cyber surface. We've got a suture manifold, and these are the annuli. Then we, we put in all these surfaces, and then we have these sort of non-product non gut regions, M1 and, and 2 and M3. And in each, each of these regions, there'll be a, a unique component of that gut surface. Because if there wasn't one, if we had two components sitting inside of there, we could do this thing where you go around one and then around the other, and you get a new surface which you can prove is not parallel to the other ones and still norm minimizing. So there's some um, some intermediate lemma that I skipped over that, that says that, that um, you'll have a unique component of the guts in each complementary region of your facet surface. <clears throat> so that's um, so the number of Surfaces in this facet surface will just be the, um, the number of components of the guts. <clears throat> now, um, you can see sort of the non-uniqueness potentially of these surfaces. If I have these two <clears throat> gut regions and neighboring, um, you know, neighboring components of the complement, and they're, they intersect the surface disjointly, then I can sort of push M1 up, because this is a product, this is in the product region here, this is the product region here, so I can push this one up and pull this one down. Again, you can think of this as a surface, I can insert a surface that, that sort of goes um, over this one and then under this one. And I can get a, a new um, norm minimizing minimal genus sacred surface in, in, the, um, in the not complement. <clears throat> And so the um, the the sort of um, non-uniqueness. I haven't, or we haven't thought this through carefully. I mean, I'm not really an expert on the Kakamitsu complex, but this sort of um, <clears throat> you know came up naturally in this in this um, in this in this work. But um, what I what I what I suspect in general, maybe I should make this as a conjecture or something, is that um, you know, this Kakamitsu complex, if you have two facet surfaces, so two maximal simplices um, that, that share a face. So that's, so this is an example where you have these two facet surfaces and the face is the sigma one, sigma three, sigma four, and then you're just changing one vertex, you're removing this one vertex and inserting another one. So this is um, like in um, Luis's talk yesterday that you, you would get some two tetrahedra um, in this context, they, they were um, shared a face. So this would be like sigma two and sigma two prime. <clears throat> and um, then there should be in in this context, there, there should there should basically be a unique way. You know, when I when I remove sigma two, there should be a unique way of inserting this new cypher surface, except in a particular case um, where in where you have a um, in this region, you might have a book of I bundles where the the guts looks like um, a hexagon crossed with a circle, and so so here you have um, I'm going to take this crossed with a circle, so it's a um, <clears throat> solid torus. It has six sutures, three components of R plus R annuli, three components of R minus R annuli, and I can cut this now. I can do a decomposition. There's sort of three different product annuli that meet each other. Um, 
And when I, when I, so there's, so I can sort of, um, I can cut through, if this is part of one of these regions, I can sort of cut through here in, in um, three different ways to create um, two Book of I bundles in either region. And, um, and I suspect, and so in this case, you would see, um, in the Kakamitsu complex, you would see some extra, um, a, a third simplex meeting, meeting there. <clears throat> so this, this hexagon could be split up in sort of three different ways. But other than that, I, I, I think that otherwise, um, if you don't have that in your manifold, I, I think that the, cat, the Kakamitsu complex should look like a pseudo manifold where every pair of simplices um, that, that intersects will have a unique face. I mean, there might be some faces that, that aren't glued to anything, but maybe, maybe not pseudo manifold is the right term, but um, the, the, should be at those two faces of it that, that meet at any given code dimension, one thing. And this corresponds to. Um, Another picture of what's happening here is that if I take a, a product to your manifold, if there's an annulus, and again, this came up in talks yesterday, if there's an annulus, an essential annulus who has boundary on, uh, on a surface, then um, I can modify that by, um, so if this is a, say, a thickened surface, and if I have some annulus going like this, then I can, I can add a, um, annulus onto there. And now when I look at the guts of this region, I cut along the, the product parts of this suture manifold. What I'm left with is uh, is one of these um, tori tor with, with, with four longitudinal sutures on it. This is what we call, um, <clears throat> with, so again, this will come up in US talk. These are called, these are called four S, we call them four STs. So, um, and then if I have another annulus that has a boundary component parallel to this one, well, I could have, um, you know, so that, <clears throat> or maybe, maybe I stack another annulus on top, and that's exactly when you get this sort of hexagonal picture. So I could, um, I could glue another annulus on here, but by, by doing a handle slide, so if I, if I slide this one over, like I'm showing here, then I could have, I could have cut this in a different order, and then you, and so that corresponds to these different ways of cutting um, cutting this up. And of course, you could have more generally, you know, higher degree polygons crossed in the circle. But because we've we've done maximal decompositions here, we're always going to get four STs in these regions. All right. So um, anyway, so if you don't have these sort of a, it, it, the parallel four STs in different components, and if you don't have that, then I think that you should have this sort of maximal. Uh, facets in pairs. How much time do I have? I forget. That my, uh, what time do we start? But we were, we were about like 10 minutes late. Or we started 10 minutes late. But oh, sorry. Know, I've, I've already gone away every time. Huh? No, no. You've like, only gone like five minutes, minutes over. Yeah, you've gone over. Okay. Five minutes okay. All right. Over. Sorry about that. Take another five. The last chunk of time. Okay. Big fun. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, um, maybe I'll just. Yeah, so sorry, you. I didn't get to the state the theorems that time. A, a theorem of Giroux um, the any two fiber surfaces are related by plumbing and deplumbing hot bands. So, the question I thought of was if you have two knots that have the same guts, are they related by plumbing and deplumbing of hot bands together with moves in the Kakamitsu complexes of the intermediate links? I have no idea if that's a good question or not, but maybe. Yeah, so maybe any two links that have the same gut, guts up to isotopy, maybe they're related in some way by um, by stabilization. And it'd be interesting to compute guts of knots and then knot tables. I think you should be able to do this in principle using standard normal surface theory algorithms. Okay, but I'll I'll stop there. Sorry for going over.